the online mode. Okay. Hello, Peter. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Laurent. Well, it's great. Uh, it's great that we have the the chance to to exchange today. Well, it's very very challenging and humbling time. I remember it's. Uh, a few months ago, we had the replenishment in Lyon of the Global Fund, and now we see that uh, that Global Health is back on top of the the international agenda with uh, with this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. So really, really challenging. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's amazing how quickly the world has changed. After the replenishment, we were. Um, very much on top of things and saying we had raised $14 billion and we could step up the fight against HIV, TB and malaria. And now, only a few months later, we're worried that we can protect the gains so far um, on HIV, TB and malaria, given the impact of, of COVID. So it's a dramatic change. Yeah, and, and we realize also that uh, this kind of health issue can be the real disruptor of globalization. I think there's very few other shock that could have happened and produced such a rapid and complete disruption of our normal life, global economics, travel. It's, you're absolutely right. It's unheard of. Unfortunately, it's not like it was completely unexpected. Um, indeed, um, before I came to the Global Fund, I spent a couple of years at Harvard, uh, and I did quite a lot of work on the economics of uh, infectious disease threats, pandemics, epidemics, and so on. And it was quite clear that this kind of scenario could happen. Um, but it's striking how the world didn't really want to listen. I remember trying to persuade the IMF to include health risks in its calculations of economic risks. And at the time, they didn't really want to hear that. I suspect that I suspect that's changed now. Now it's going to uh, it's uh, it's going to become a major concern for for years to come. And you you mentioned IMF and health, and uh, this is really this connection. I think I'd like to elaborate a bit more with you this connection between global health and finance, because we see that COVID nineteen uh, is bringing uh, a global disruption, but it's also it's going to require a lot of resources, and it uh, it brings back to the forefront the question of financing global health. In your, in your, both as a matter of emergency, but also on the long run. Uh, your background is, is uh, and you're really the man of, the, really a key man in that, in that respect, because you're a man of global health, of so the executive director of the, of the Global Fund, but you're also a man of finance. All your career has been uh, before connected with finance, so you span the two fields. And I'd like really to have your view regarding the, the relation of these two fields uh, in the past, but now uh, at the moment, the interconnection for the, the answer to, to this new pandemic and in the future. How do you see this, uh, this relation between global health and finance? Well, one, uh, sadly, I think there has been a bit of a chasm a ravine between the worlds of global health and global finance. And when I stopped being the chief executive of Standard Chartered, one of the world's largest international banks, and went to Harvard, one of the things I wanted to do was to look at the interaction. And when I look back on it, I'm afraid to say um, I failed. Um, I wrote papers on the need to do all this for the world. The world didn't really listen. Um, and even as recently as February, when the pandemic really began to expand beyond China, and Italy was obviously one of the first places it hit, I reached out to old friends, central bank governors, 
CEOs of banks and investment management institutions and said, you guys need to focus on this. This is, this is going to hit us. And I got very little reaction. Um, one of my, um, one central bank governor responded, his office responded to me by saying that he would be happy to meet me later in the summer. And I went, I went back saying, you know, <laughs> I don't think that's kind of, kind of work. But, but so the world of finance and economics didn't really understand global health. And I have to say, though, that I think the world of global health has not been very good at expressing itself in ways that the worlds of economics and finance understand. And because that communication has been bad, that's one of the reasons we've ended up under-investing in preventing such things as we've seen with COVID-19. Um, You're never going to prevent everything, but you can at least be better prepared. And I'm afraid to say the worst thing to do is to only focus on how you respond, because the response, as we've learned to our cost, is always going to be incredibly expensive. Yeah, and the problem also of the world of finance is that there's a lot of short, short termism, and uh, it's uh, the question that uh, that arises with uh, with COVID-19. You can say you have the same short sightedness for other global challenges, uh, and do you think it's something that can change, or it's uh, it's going to be one shock, and after it's going to be back to normalcy? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, the history of The history of pandemics is one of panic and neglect, i.e. you panic when it happens and then you have a short memory and you rapidly forget. But I, I think it is incumbent on us this time to make sure we don't just go into a cycle of neglect again and that we realize that these long-term, low-probability, high-impact events, they do happen. And when they do happen, they make a massive difference. And I hope we think about that not just in the context of global health, but we apply that same mindset to the way we think about climate change. Because some you've got similar issues going on there where it's sort of a bit too far away, you know, it might not affect me, um, but it's the same sort of issue. Um, It probably will happen. Some disastrous things will happen at some point, and we need to start preparing for it now. Yeah, but you see, the, the, the Global Fund, it's a financial institution, but it's also multilateral institutions. So you take care of the international answer, in a way, the financial dimension of this international answer to the pandemics. But, well, the, the world of finance is much broader. It brings... Uh, private finance, uh, huge resources. You think you can play in the future a role of catalyst to bring back this world, this broader world of finance to, to the responsibility, to be part of the answer and not just okay to be mobilized when the, the situation uh, is bad and then to go back to something normal. What's, how do you see a new role for the Global Fund in the future in that respect? It's an interesting question. Um, I do think the role of the Global Fund is likely to evolve as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, but quite what scope or dimensions of that evolution, I, I'm not, it's not immediately clear to me um, now. Um, and I must admit, we are f so focused on sort of what we're doing right now to help countries respond to the crisis that worrying about where we will be one year or two years down the road, I'm afraid I haven't sort of quite got my head around yet. Hmm. Just uh, just uh, because it, you're, you're right, we are, we are really at the moment we focus on the, on the immediate answer to this crisis. Well, the Global Fund they are, they have been, uh, has been created, and Italy actually was part of this, uh, of this creation, played a, a major role. Uh, the, the Global Fund, well, it was set up to, to answer an emergency, the ed pandemics. 
and it has accumulated a, a huge amount of experience over time in uh, tackling in answering these three diseases, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And now you're faced with a new pandemic with COVID-19. Uh, what uh, what do you think the Global Fund with this experience can bring to this fight against COVID-19? What are the lessons learned from these three pandemics that may be relevant to this new uh, new challenge? And in particular, what could be the role of the of the civil societies, the communities that play such a major role? Uh, can they play a role also in this uh, in this fight against COVID-19? Well, that I think is probably the single biggest lesson that we can offer. As you say, um, the Global Fund was created to fight the last big pandemic to hit humanity. HIV AIDS, and it's a fight we we haven't yet finished. We've, we've made huge progress, but we still have too many people being infected and dying of HIV AIDS. But when you look at what has worked and what has really made a difference, one of the big things that made a massive difference in the fight against HIV AIDS was the not just the engagement, but the leadership of communities and civil society. The reality is, is if you want to change behaviors, change the way treatment services are delivered. If you want to reach out to the most marginalized communities, you need the people themselves who are most affected, deeply involved. And I think that's a very powerful and important lesson for the way we fight COVID-19. The reality is, is that much of the response to COVID-19 thus far has been quite top down quite technocratic, and yet if we are to sustain the fight, and the reality is there isn't a quick fix, we are going to have a fairly, you know, even even if we quickly discover a vaccine, it's 12, 18 months before we can roll it out at scale. So we have a sustained fight on how to contain, so how to identify, how to support people in isolation, how to support those affected. And that requires the communities to be engaged. And um, I, I don't know that all countries have quite worked out. In fact, I think most countries haven't quite worked out how to do that well yet. And I think one of the things the Global Fund can bring, and when I say the Global Fund, I don't just mean the, those of us sitting in Geneva. I mean, the ecosystem of the Global Fund is that experience. And indeed, we're already leveraging on that. We're drawing in our civil society partners in the countries at a global level to help bring that kind of perspective and experience to the fight against COVID-19. Yeah, you, you're right. You mentioned, I think you're very right, that the, the answer to COVID-19 has been very much top down. But the Global Fund, they have developed in the fight against the three last pandemics, this ecosystem you mentioned, with the networks, the communities, and so on. Uh, now, the, one of my questions and uh, my worries, I have to confess, is that we see in sub-Saharan Africa that COVID-19 is going to be to have probably some kind of direct impact, but also a big indirect impact with population in lockdowns, with uh, uh, the, the, the pressure on uh, the health systems. We, we read a, a few days ago that uh, uh, there might be a doubling of, uh, of casualties from HIV AIDS uh, uh, in the next uh, year because of COVID-19. So do, have you been able already through your network, through your ecosystem to confirm this, uh, this perception? And how do you plan with the Global Fund both to combine your contribution to the fight against the Global Fund and maintaining your effort to mitigate uh, the, the impact of this new pandemic on the, the people living with HIV AIDS uh, uh, and the TB and malaria programs? Well, this is what keeps me awake at night. Uh, I think that the indirect impact of COVID-19 through the impact on other diseases in places like Africa, 
could be much more than the direct impact. Africa is much younger than Europe. Only 3% of the people are over 65. Whereas in much of Europe, that number is between 18 and 20%. Yeah. And we know that COVID-19 affects those who are eldest the most. And that's where most of the mortality is. But the burden of other infectious diseases in Africa and in other poor countries is much, much higher. And we could easily see very significant upsurges in deaths due to HIV, due to TB, due to malaria. And also, if the vaccination programs get disrupted due to po polio or measles and so on. I've seen the same analyses as you, and they are very sobering. Um, you, could eat, you could see a doubling of deaths of HIV. You could see a doubling of deaths of TB and a doubling of deaths of malaria. Probably the one that would happen fastest is malaria. We are absolutely determined not to let that happen. Uh, and we, are, we have been moving very swiftly with our partners to take action in two ways. One is directly to mitigate the impact on the HIV, TB, and malaria programs. So making changes to the way they are run so that they can still be delivered. And second is to help countries in their responses to COVID because unless they can respond to COVID, the health systems will be overwhelmed and then we will see the impact on the other diseases anyway. We uh, introduced some flexibilities in the way our grants are delivered in the beginning of March, um, which would allow countries to use some of the grants they had from us to do this mitigation and to do the um, straight the responses to COVID. So far, 83 countries and six regional programs have used those flexibilities with about $138 million. But we also knew that wouldn't be enough. So we, um, in the early April, we introduced a second mechanism to make available another 500 million. The total scope of the first program is 500 million. We then made a second mechanism available for another 500 million, which we call the COVID-19 response mechanism, C19RM. And we are right now in the process of making disbursements um, on this second mechanism. Uh, one thing I would say is that um, we designed this second mechanism in a way that um, if donors wanted to support the Global Fund's actions, they could contribute. And the first public donor to make an additional contribution is actually Italy, um, which we're thrilled by. Um, Italy has uh, made an additional contribution of half a million euro. And this is on top of the bigger contribution that the um, Italy makes to the Global Fund as a whole. But it was a very important signal that um, recognized that we have this new mechanism and that we need to move very fast in supporting countries in their response to COVID-19. Yeah, that's the role of Italy. I think it's very, it's very important to, that they play their, their, a leadership role for the creation of Global Fund. That's great at the moment. They are, after being so badly hit, that they are really so mobilized. Uh, I'd like to, to ask you, you mentioned the vaccines. We know that it's going to be some, not immediately, even if there, there are some good news in the press, but uh, it's going to take uh, probably probably several months. You mentioned 12 months, 18 months. There would be a chance if it would be shorter, but anyway, it's going to take time. Uh, and the question of diagnostics, the question of therapeutic, there's a need of innovation or repositioning or whatsoever, but it's going to cost a lot of money. And it's going to raise again 
as it has been the case for HIV AIDS, uh, uh, the question of access to treatments, uh, drugs, uh, for whom? At an affordable cost. Uh, and the question uh, for me is that there was uh, this initiative you launched a few days ago uh, around WHO and other players, uh, ACT Accelerators. How is it going to work? We see that there was uh, this fundraising, a lot of money was raised, but how it's going to work uh, on the long run? On the long run, and what are for you the challenges? The challenges you see linked to large-scale deployment of these new tools, therapeutics, uh, diagnostics, and potentially vaccines when they they come. Well, the um, it's it, actor is the access to COVID tools accelerator. And this is an initiative that involves both public and private and civil society and um, very much has its uh, leadership coming out of um, uh, Europe. There are four partnerships within the actor framework. There's one for vaccines, one for therapeutics, one for diagnostics, and then there is a cross-cutting one on health systems, because we recognize that it is not enough just to have the individual products, you actually have to be able to deliver them. The Global Fund is deeply involved in the diagnostics, the therapeutics, and the health systems. We are less involved on the vaccine side because that's very much Gavi, um, Gavi's role to um, lead on the vaccines. And we work in close partnership with Gavi. We share a building with them. You know, that's what they're really good at. We're, we're very good at the, um, the other stuff. The nature of the challenge varies enormously between vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. On vaccines, we don't have anything. And we don't even know whether we will get something. Yeah. We have an unprecedented effort, amazing amount of scientific collaboration. Um, so, you know, I'm optimistic about it. Um, but we should also be very realistic that the three biggest infectious diseases in the world at the moment, HIV, TB and malaria, we yeah. don't have vaccines for any of them, right? <laughs> um, and, and that is not for want of trying. Um, there's been plenty of effort. On therapeutics, I think there are something like 1,200 different trials going on, but nobody has yet identified uh, what you might call a game changer. Um, and so there's still a huge amount of work. Bleach to, is not a game changer. Bleach is not a game changer. <laughs> well, it is a game changer, but it's the wrong kind of game changer. Um, but once something does get identified, these issues of access are going to be crucial. And we want to learn from the experience of HIV AIDS, because it is true that the creation of the Global Fund was what helped make antiretrovirals available to many people in the poorest communities in the world and thus saved many, many lives. However, it took us too long. The Global Fund was only created in 2002 and many people in Africa and other poor parts of the world, millions of people died before antiretrovirals were available. One of the things we are very focused on is we don't want that to happen again. If new therapeutics are identified, we want to be um, right there at the start arguing for equitable access for those who are most vulnerable. On diagnostics, we're in a different situation again in that we already do have diagnostics. Um, there are issues about availability, but we are already, Global Fund is already purchasing sophisticated diagnostics and delivering them um, to uh, the countries in which we invest. Um, and 
this is crucially important, the issues of access, because in fact, places like Africa need to move even more swiftly to sophisticated strategies of massive testing, tracing and containment than Europe has. And the reason is, is that lockdowns just aren't, aren't very sustainable in societies where many people basically eat what they earn each day. They have no savings. And the governments can't provide backup. Um, so a lockdown is not going to last very long. And secondly, acute care systems in Europe have been put under huge pressure. Consider a country like Liberia, where the total intensive care capacity for the country is four beds. Four. Um, so they can't rely on the care side. They can't rely on the lockdowns. So they have to go for testing and tracing and isolation. And that means they have to have the tests. Um, and so we have a, a very real issue right now about getting sufficient access to volumes of tests, being able to fund those, but also very practical issues about lab capacity, lab technicians, um, how, you, how you actually make it all um, uh, work. But the thing that is very good about the actor structure is that we have the players there. We, we have the private sector, we have multilaterals like the Global Fund, we have the government, we have civil society, and, and there's a real sense of problem solving to, to get to the right answer. Yeah. Well, but the pandemic is really, this new pandemic is putting the older uh, health system under stress, both in the north and, the, and in the south. Uh, and it really, it brings back to the, to the front the, the idea of the, the role that, that health is a global issue, that there's interconnection between uh, these different issues and that you need to, to tackle this kind of, uh, of challenge. Uh, you need to have proper uh, health systems. And one of the, the questions that arise from this, uh, from this pandemic is that health systems, health workers are the first line of defense against this pandemic. There were a lot of debate before this about uh, the importance of uh, uh, building, uh, uh, strengthening health system, the three pandemics, but also uh, strengthening health system, probably this debate is going to 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 gain steam in the in the in the future. In your view, what's um, what should be done? What in the in this area to respond to COVID nineteen? How the global fund and other agencies, uh, players, partners can help this health system? Well, to to meet this challenge and to and to 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 keep uh, uh, to keep functioning. Well, this is a a really important topic and a, um, a quite a big and complex one. I'll just make a, a few points. The first is that there's an absolute priority to protect health workers. This has been recognised in advanced economies facing the challenge of COVID, but it is even more true in places like Africa because the ratio of health workers to the population is so much smaller. Um, they have too few health workers anyway, they certainly can't afford to lose any more. And, and so we see one of the big priorities and one of the things we are putting funding into right now is protective, personal protective equipment for health workers. And remember, most of these health workers are women um, and uh, in many societies, it's more difficult to direct resources to women, but we have to change that. We have to make clear that um, when you have, say, community health workers, um, they are the vital 
the absolutely vital delivery uh, mechanism, not just for the COVID response, but for treatment for malaria to save the lives of children, for treatment of all, for vaccination. Um, so protecting the health workers is absolutely um, critical. The second thing I would say is that this is a lesson that public health is crucially important. In almost every health system in the world, there is relative overinvestment in hospitals and relative underinvestment in primary care. And normally public health is the sort of most neglected part of the system. Well, I think we've learned the lesson the hard way that underinvestment in public health is a, a huge uh, weakness. And public health is about the public, which means that you have to involve communities. And women in particular. And women in particular, absolutely. And in fact, in the Global Fund, we tend to avoid talking about health systems because it's a very technocratic expression. And we tend to talk about systems for health, including community systems for health, because ultimately you want the system for health to be owned by the community. And I think one of the things we will learn from COVID is to try and change the relationship between the way communities think about their health systems and their sense of ownership um, and leadership um, with regard to them. Yeah, just on the point about gender and women, um, there are a number of aspects of this crisis that are um, very concerning. Um, one is that most health workers are women, so they're particularly vulnerable. Um, second is that um, in most lockdowns environments, in fact, across the places that have done lockdowns, there's been pretty compelling evidence of increases in gender-based violence. Um, and a third is that women are often the most vulnerable to some of the other conditions that could be affected by COVID. And so, for example, roughly speaking, a thousand adolescent girls and young women are infected with HIV every day. There has been massive disruption to the prevention programs that are trying to protect these um, young women. And the honest answer is we don't quite know what the impact um, of, of that is. Um, but it is very concerning when you have vulnerable populations and the programs you're using to reach out to them are not working in the way that was intended. Oh, I completely, I completely agree, and I think this uh, this question of uh, of communities and the impact on the ground of the of the the, the pandemics is something uh, absolutely key. You've built in the global fund a, a, a quite extraordinary uh, system of networks partnerships involving the government, the civil society, the technical agen agencies, the private sector, the people affected by the diseases. Uh, I'd like if we can come back a minute on the, the role of the, the private sector in the COVID-19 uh, response and uh, how do you see they can contribute the most? I think it, what I've seen in the response to the crisis actually is that our private sector partners have been um, very uh, active. So we have a number of technology partners who have been very creative actually in helping problem solve how to support uh, communities and implementers who suddenly have to shift from face-to-face -face interaction to doing what we're doing now. And 
when you're a community group in Niger or you're doing bed net delivery in uh, Guinea-Bissau, that's quite a challenge. And, and we have had a lot of support from our technology partners on that kind of thing. Um, I'd also say um, the other, in the same way that Italy um, was the um, first public sector donor to um, add additional funds to our COVID-19 response mechanism, um, Apple, through Product Red, was the first on the private sector side um, if you buy their new iPhone and you um, buy the product red version, uh, a portion of that um, goes to the Global Fund's COVID-19 response mechanism. I think the bigger challenge when we look forward is going to be how we think about the role of the private sector, not in the heat of the crisis, but when you're talking about prevention and preparation. And that's always been um, the difficult bit of it. Um, people are willing to, in a sense, rush to the crisis and help, but it's when you don't have the crisis. And to be fair to the private sector, most governments didn't do enough either. Um, uh, so we, we need to, with, we need the whole of society to think differently um, about the nature of the threats from infectious diseases and um, what we do about them outside um, the crisis. The, the analogy I would give you is many fewer people die nowadays of fires in their homes. Now, we do have better fire engines than we used to. They're faster, they have better pumps and things. But that isn't what made the difference. What made the difference is that a modern house is built according to fire protection codes, the electricity has certain things, all the fabrics on your furniture are fire retardant, there, there are rules about fire escapes and all this sort of stuff. And it's, it's, that is the equivalent of the prevention and preparation. And it's a bit boring. It's not as exciting as a shiny fire engine, but it's actually the thing that has made a difference. And in the world of global health, we need to do all of that. We need all that um, detailed, nitty gritty work um, on prevention and preparation that will make us all much safer. It's going to be a big, uh, a big challenge for the international organization beyond the emergency answer to the pandemics. Well, to to build the the resilience for the future, and this is something uh, you see a role for the global funds for this, because there will be a lot of lessons to learn from this crisis. How do you do? You see the future of the, the global funds and uh, in, in preparing the world for the outbreaks of new global health risks such as the COVID-19? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is change the language and the conception of global health security. Too often when people talk about global health security, what they're really talking about is making better protections against diseases that might kill people in rich countries. Hmm. And they kind of quietly ignore the diseases that are actually still killing people in poor countries. And I tell you, my nightmare is that we find ways of controlling and containing and reducing the mortality of COVID-19 in Europe and North America and Japan and places, but it still is killing people in poor countries. And then the Global Fund is given COVID-19 to deal with as a kind of residual ex-pandemic. Hmm. And in a way, I mean, if we're honest, that is what we are dealing with, with a disease like TB or HIV. 
which are no longer significant public health threats in the rich world, but continue to kill. I mean, across the three diseases, it's 2.7 million people a year. Yeah. So one of the things I think we need to do is have a concept of global health security that actually says we have to protect everybody from these big infectious diseases. We, you know, it's, in, it's intolerable just to um, protect the people in rich countries. Um, we have to um, protect the, everyone in the world, wherever they live, from COVID-19, from HIV, from TB, from malaria. And it's just not a good enough answer to say that we'll only do it if it's affecting us, if we live in, you know, Rome or London or Geneva or New York or someone. It's also not very practical because the reality is, is that the things you do to fight the existing infectious diseases are the things you need to do to fight new threats like COVID-19. And in fact, one of the reasons Africa has actually done rather better than people thought yeah. is because um, there is a lot of expertise there and a lot of systems and infrastructure around fighting infectious disease, which is being used. So for example, the diagnostic tests we are delivering um, to um, not just Africa, but places like um, India as well, um, these are using the instruments and the laboratories that we have put in place, either to do viral load testing for HIV or diagnosis for um, TB. So it's the same sorts of systems and capabilities you require. So what I would like to see as we come out of this crisis is a commitment to a much more ambitious, bolder vision of health security that leaves no one behind when we make the world a safer place. That's a big, big ambition. And do you think that uh, because the, the multilateral system is in crisis at the moment, sometimes it comes under attack, do you think that this, uh, this crisis is going to be like a waking call for the world and that there going to be this degree of wisdom? Well, I suppose what I would say is, if this isn't going to wake us up, I'm really not quite sure. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what would wake us up. Um, uh, and um, of course, there are going to be lots of different perspectives and challenges uh, and all that. Um, but I mean, I, I do think that continuing the way we have been doing um, is not a is not a sustainable path. We we have to learn the lessons um, from what has happened, um, and um, we you know we won't get it perfect and we won't get everything right. Uh, but I mean, this has should have taught people that in some ways the world is quite a small place from the perspective of a pathogen um we're all the same species we're all interconnected and responses have to be global here in europe we have been in italy in france in spain in the uk we have been uh, really terribly hit by this uh, by this pandemic Europe has played a, a role in a <clears throat> major role in defending the multilateral system in creating the global funds now what do you expect from Europe uh, in the in the, 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 the months and the years to come I know that you you had exchange with uh, President Macron with uh, uh, Prime Minister Conte from with all the leaders, uh, the European leaders at the moment, are you optimistic for Europe to overcome this situation and uh, and be a player, a force for good in the future and building this uh, global resilience? 
I am optimistic. I mean, I think it's it's hard. Um, I think political leaders are under enormous pressure, understandably, to focus on the challenges they're facing in their own countries. But I've been impressed by um, how quickly leaders, at least in some countries, have looked beyond their own borders. Uh, only yesterday I was speaking to um, the Foreign Affairs Commission of the Italian Parliament, um, and I was impressed by the level of interest and engagement um, and on the issues that are affecting the rest of the world. Um, and so I, I think Europe both can and has to play a leading role in mobilizing the global response. And look, it's, this is a disease where it's not going to work to solve it in one country. Because as long as it can run free in other parts of the world, it will come back and bite you again. And, and so we are going to have to tackle this uh, as a global uh, issue. Um, so with initiatives like the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, the ACTOR initiative, um, I think Europe is taking the right steps. I have to say it is going to involve money uh, because the reality is if we want the poorest parts of the world to have access to tests, to protective equipment and so on, somebody is going to have to buy them for them. And in a sense, that's what the Global Fund was created to do for HIV, TB and malaria. Um, but uh, I, as I say, in the last few weeks, I've been really um, very uh, impressed by the way uh, people across Europe and leaders across Europe um, have, in a sense, taken their heads above their immediate challenges and looked to the broader challenges facing the world. So you're optimistic? Reasonably. Yeah, I, in my kind of job, you have to be optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> in any case, we are we are going to to support you as friends, uh, Europe, and I think uh, you're doing really a great, great job. And uh, well, this is more more necessary than ever, and it's great that we have the global fund at the moment. I think. Well, thank you, Laura. And um, I have to say, I think the work that the Friends of the Global Fund in Europe does um, is fantastic. Um, uh, the Global Fund is only successful because of the broad ecosystem of partners, of supporters, of advocates um, uh, that um, help us um, both mobilize resources, but also help us deliver um, the services to the people um, who need them. I mean, I have to, I think, um, I think it was Bill Gates who once said that the Global Fund was one of the kindest things that humanity had ever done for humanity. Um, and I say that without, I mean, I'm relatively recent. I only came in a couple of years ago. Um, uh, and I think that's absolutely true, though. Um, the, the Global Fund is a pretty extraordinary creation, and for me, running it is a, it's a complete privilege um, uh, to, to be in this uh, position. But it's also a daunting responsibility because uh, we are acutely conscious that um, we have so many people's lives at stake. And this was true even before COVID. Um, it was Bill Gates, actually, again, who pointed out to me that I think the Global Fund, it's been calculated, saves 14,600 lives every day. And that puts a different spin on sort of getting up in the morning and thinking, is this going to be a good day or not? Um, when you realize that's what's at stake. I think these are perfect, conclusive words. It's been great talking to you, Laura. It's great. So all the best. and. Uh, 
Hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, Laurent. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Bye-bye.